Hello. Uh, I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, I feel as future healthcare providers, it's pretty important that we, uh, you know, try to learn about as many different systems as we can to try to be able to make a, you know, a good judgment call on what's best for our patients. Um, so I would like to just introduce uh, Dr. Weisbart. He's the uh, chair for the Missouri chapter of uh, PNHP, uh, Physicians for National Health Program. And he's also a uh, Washington University uh, faculty member at uh, their medical school. And if you can uh, go ahead and join me in uh, giving him a warm welcome. Thanks. Thanks. And thank Richard and the rest of the group for bringing me in. They're, they're so easy to work with. It's great. So hello. Uh, so this is my second or third time to come, to, to come here? The second, yeah. Well, thank you for having me back. So um, we're going to have an interesting discussion, I promise you. Um, we'll, we're going to talk about um, how healthcare works today a bit compared to the rest of the world, how it works in the United States compared to the rest of the world. We'll talk a bit about what's changing. We'll talk a bit about the, uh, the, the better idea, I think, which is basically this, and we'll go through that in some detail. But probably what will interest you the most is that we'll also talk about what this would mean for physicians were we to do this. Um, so what would it mean for your potential earning potential? What it would mean, how many of you are here are in medical school? And people from other areas? Where, where else are you all from? Are you, you didn't raise your hand, so you're? Dental school. Dental school, okay, yeah, of course, yeah. Dental school people? A few, okay, yeah. So my father a, was a dentist and my brother's a dentist. So uh, that's kind of the run of show. That's what we're going to talk about. We took the time for a discussion, too. My background, as you started to hear, I'm, I'm a volunteer. I'm not paid to be here. Um, pretty much everybody in the organization with maybe four or five staff folks are volunteers. We're just here because we, we think this is really important. And I personally wish where I, when I were in your point in my training that I had learned more about this stuff. So I'm thrilled that you're here. So there's that. Um, I'm a family physician, as you heard. Um, I practiced uh, family medicine in Chicago for um, 20 years delivering babies and all that stuff. Um, then I moved to St. Louis in 2003 where I became chief medical officer of, uh, of Express Scripts and learned a lot more about the business side of things. And that, you, I think you're gonna see, is gonna influence a fair amount of how I approach this. The business case for what we're talking about to me is really important. And so we're gonna go into a little more detail about that. Um, and uh, lastly, as you heard, um, I, I chair the Missouri chapter of this organization, Physicians for a National Health Program. We have a number of dentists in it, not just physicians. We have a lot of medical students. We have people who have really no healthcare career process going on. So um, we welcome everybody to be, to be in the group. So there's that. Uh, in Missouri, we started about five years ago with about 50 people. We now reach about, about 2,000 uh, across the state. Uh, and in Missouri, since we live in Missouri, we also, oops, sorry. We also advocate for, for Medicaid expansion in Missouri because we think that's also an important strategy. So, little landscape background. Here's um, life expectancy. You've probably seen stuff like that. These, companies, these countries scrolling are countries that live longer than we do. Some might surprise you. Um, some of my charts will have so many countries that they're in a relatively small font and so you can't really uh, read them. We'll, we'll be the country that's a different color, typically red against green ones. So there's, there's that. Um, some won't have that many countries, and it's not because I'm cherry picking which data to show you, it's because they come from different sources, and that's what they, they have. All of my charts that have numbers on them and such will have a footnote, so if you want to know exactly where I'm pulling the data from, I can tell you right now uh, when you, if, you, if you need to ask that question. So, um, so there's that. So anyway, you know this, right? We're going to come back to this, but you already knew that we didn't have the best life expectancy in the world. That's not only because of healthcare systems. There's other factors that feed into it, but that's one. And I'll present more data to you that I think will make you think that the healthcare system actually is pretty darn important about that. So life expectancy, and you know this, right? You know that we spend more per person than really any other country, roughly double the rest of the modern world. And we're going to come into that uh, a fair amount. So the question really is, why do we spend so much? Is it because we're all running to the doctor all the time? Is it because we're doing all these tests and procedures? Is it because, what, what is it that makes healthcare so darned expensive in the United States? You knew this, but, it, but why is it so expensive? So I submit to you that there's two reasons. One, we have extraordinarily high prices. 
They have extraordinarily high prices. And we're not gonna go into that in any detail today because tomorrow, if you're in the neighborhood, we're gonna show this video, um, the pharma, big pharma market failure in, at room P IPE241. So tomorrow at noon, we're gonna show this video and that goes a lot more into the pricing piece using pharma as an example, but we'll talk more about that. So we're not gonna talk much about prices tonight, but come tomorrow if you're, if you're able to. So there's that. So prices is one of the big reasons. The other big reason is that we are incredibly complicated in the way we choose to organize our healthcare. So it's not because we go to the doctor so much, right? Here we are going to the physician a lot less often than most other countries. These countries out here that go eight, 10, 12 times a year, they're very quick visits. They're not, you know, 45 minute 92915s. They're very quick visits. They're, you've got hypertension, let's come in, come in again and let's see how your blood pressure is doing. It's doing well, get out of here. It's very quick uh, visits and they don't have the elaborate bureaucratic coding requirements that we've imposed upon ourselves. So they're able to do that. And they have, as you saw a minute ago, better outcomes generally too. So there's that. We don't have that many physicians. We're sort of low on the pack, middle, middle of the range on the pack of the number of physicians. But there's one thing that we lead the world in terms of numbers, and that's this. We've got plenty of those folks. We've got plenty of those folks. So if you do the arithmetic, and I, I have, <coughs> of the number of people working in the United States in billing and accounts receivable for hospitals, and compare that to the number of beds there are in hospitals, Turns out that there's actually more people, more full-time people working in billing and accounts receivable than there are beds. So the average hospital in the United States can afford to put, could currently today, put somebody full-time at the foot of every bed and have an entire department left. They have an entire department left. So that seems silly, all right? It's also really expensive. If you think about it, most hospitals, and I, I can't confess too much, uh, a depth of knowledge about the hospitals here in Kirksville, but most hospitals have floors, if not buildings, full of people who this is their whole gig. It's managing the insurance industry. So, so there's this. And it turns out that we actually do this more than the insurance industry does this, if you look at it. So in the United States, in this analysis, roughly three-fourths of what we spend on health care is actually on clinical care. Another 9.4% is on administration that's not related to billing and insurance related activities. It's not related to that, about 10%. And that's true in most of the world. They still have a certain percentage on that stuff. But then there's the rest of all this. This is all just insurance money, billing and insurance related activities, <clears throat> of which private insurers are not the majority. Private insurers, the insurance companies, are not the biggest piece. It's all this other stuff. So. Think of what that means. The insurance industry has managed to shift most of the work to everybody else. So the average physician having, I think, 80 or $90,000 of staff just managing this per, per physician. Again, this is expensive and it's not going to improve health outcomes. It's just, it's just money and we're spending a lot of money. So there's that. So how is this organized in other countries? How do other countries set up their systems? So I would submit to you that there's, to simplify it, there's three basic models. You could talk about a national health service, which is not what we're talking about, and that's actually socialized medicine. That's where the, the, na the nation's government, through public funds, employs physicians directly and builds brick and mortar hospitals, owns the hospitals, and directly employs the physicians. You're, on, you're a government employee. That is the definition of socialism. Socialism, as you recall, is when the government owns the means of production. So this would be that. That's what they do in Great Britain, and that's what we do in the VA. So there's that. That's national health service is the critical word. That's not what we're talking about, and I don't think this is a model that would resonate in a dominant way in the United States anytime soon. So that, from one point of view, could be considered an extreme point of view. Then there's a, the other opposite, sort of almost extreme way of setting it up, which is how we do it today, and I call it wild, wild west health insurance. So, you know, multiple funding streams, huge gaps of people not getting any coverage. Um, we're the only country that does it this way. So I present it to you like this because I think of it that there's two sort of extreme, almost, models of how you could set things up, but that there's actually a conservative approach right in the middle, in my mind, which is just national health insurance, not a service, just the insurance. And really that's all we're talking about tonight is insurance. We're not talking about socialism, which is that. It's not my, I'm, I'm a good capitalist. We're, we're talking about national health insurance. 
My wife and I had a small business for 10 years. I've, not, I've got no problem with the, but any system needs to be, you know, not unfettered. So anyway, there's this, just national health insurance. And this is public funding, right, funded by taxes, it's, but it's private delivery. It's every delivery model you can think of because this is not adjusting that. That's how they do it in Canada, and that's what Medicare does. So that's a national health insurance, and it's a very common form around the world. So important differences. So there's actually a bill in Congress that proposes a national health insurance. It's called H.R. 676, and I'd like you to repeat after me, H.R. 676. H. That's why I drove to Kirksville. I just love hearing a group say that. Okay, so good. Okay, so this bill, uh, just this is the bill that would actually create and improve Medicare and give it to everybody. So really, it just says two things. I want you to go home tonight and Google HR 676. It'll come up very quickly. Uh, it's it's a 30-page double-spaced bill. It's it's big font. It's easy to read. It'll take you uh, an hour, maybe two hours to get through it, and it it won't become law the way it's written. It doesn't have as much detail as laws tend to have. So as it moves through the legislature, it'll be bigger. So now is a great time to read it because it gives you a strategic approach to really everything you can be thinking of. Not probably everything, but it, it'll give you a strategic approach. If you, you're wondering, well, what will that do to this? What about, what about this? Um, there's probably not the whole 30-page answer to that, but there's at least a few paragraphs talking about Here's how you would approach that problem. So I'd recommend you read it. It really just says two things. It says improve Medicare and expand it to everybody. That's really all that it says. So improve Medicare. There are things we know that are wrong with Medicare today. Um, for example, there's gaps in the benefit design. So if you have diabetes and uh, I want to send you to a cardiologist and I want you to get a bypass operation or I want you to go to an ophthalmologist and get uh, something, uh, I can send you to all those things through Medicare. But if I want to send you for your diabetes for an hour with a nutritionist, not a covered benefit. So there's some gaps in the benefit design for Medicare. Um, so fix that. Improve the benefits. And we, so we know what they are, so improve those. And they're spelled out in detail in the bill. Improve the benefit design. And then get rid of the financial barriers to care. Medicare has built into it significant co-pays and deductibles. And so most seniors, maybe I should back up. Um, you know the difference between Medicare and Medicaid? Everybody have that? Or? Okay, good. So seniors who have uh, Medicare and if they can afford it, most of them will buy <clears throat> a supplement or a wrap because Medicare today has significant uh, co-pays and deductibles. So those are financial barriers. So get rid of the financial barriers and uh, then you don't need to have these supplements and wraps that are overwhelmingly confusing about purchasing. So improve Medicare. That's what that means. Get rid of the the gaps in the benefit design and get rid of the financial barriers and then give it to everybody. Give it to Congress. Give it to the president. Give it to the mayor. Give it to, you see a little pause there? Give it to the mayor. Give it to, um, give it to you. Give it to me. Give it to everybody. Give it to all Americans. And that's, that's not just sort of nice to have. That's critical because by giving it to everybody, you accomplish two very important things. Um, number one, you've simplified the administrative process. You've greatly simplified that. So I showed you all that money we're wasting on billing and insurance related. If you just expand Medicare by 50% and still have all of the other insurance companies going on, going on you, can't do, you haven't done anything to reduce the overhead of managing the insurance industry. So one tempting way to think, I don't really want to go full throttle overnight. I want to, go to, age, I want to expand Medicare by going down to age 60, then to age 55 and then to age 50. And I would be fine with that. Um, that's actually what Lyndon Johnson first proposed back in the mid-60s when Medicare was created, to kind of gradually expand it like that. You could do it that way, but if you think about that, that's a fairly expensive strategy because you're going to um, have to absorb the cost of care and not get the savings, which we'll walk through in a few minutes. So one reason to include everybody is because it's way cheaper to include everybody. You get those administrative savings. The second reason to include everybody is because that protects the program. That protects it. We, you know, we um, just last week uh, we had a state legislature that, that sponsored a program to get um, um, some uh, lower-income kids in St. Louis this summer with summer jobs. I was thrilled about that. And then I read that he got that program funded by taking money from the TANF program. It turns out the TANF program had some surplus they didn't need, so it was actually a terrific strategy. But that's what happens in the budget: is that when you want to do something. 
you, you find one of the groups that's not talking right now and you take money from them and that's what happens in healthcare, right? That's why Medicaid is so limited in what it can offer. That's why so many things that when you're fragmented, you're vulnerable. So by having everybody in the same program, the, the legislator who wants to do something to hurt the program can't because it's their program. It's their spouse's program. It's the program that gives healthcare to their children. So having everybody in it is really important. It makes it way more efficient, which I'll show you data about in a few minutes, and it protects the program. Then you wouldn't need all these other complex programs that we've created for ourselves. So that's, that's what we mean. All we're talking about are those two things. So it would be publicly funded, right? Your tax dollars basically is where the money would come from. And it turns out if you make less than about $500,000 a year, um, you would come out ahead. You would pay a little bit more taxes, but you wouldn't be paying premiums or co-pays or deductibles. So if you make less than about $500,000 a year, you would come out financially ahead. 95% or more of Americans would actually find personal savings by doing this. So publicly funded with a, with a quasi-governmental public agency organizing it, that's in some detail in the bill. Privately delivered. This is so important to me. I mean, today, okay, so your second years mainly? First years? So first, hand, first year, raise your hands. Second years, raise your hands. Third, any other years, raise your hands. Okay, so I'm gonna bet, raise your hand if you're planning to go out into solo private practice. Cool, excellent. So you guys are weird, right? You guys are weird. You're odd, because it's really hard to do that. Because, the, and, and I'm gonna put words in the rest of your mouth, because the administrative burden of managing a practice today are really hard, really hard. You can do it, but it's really hard. There's strategies to do that, and I understand that, but it's really hard. So my career, I always wanted to work in a large group, right? I worked at, at a group with 130 physicians in Chicago. I liked that, I liked the stimulation of that. But I went there because I wanted to go there, and, and I, I would have a really hard time not going into it. So my point is very few physicians are going into any setting other than a large group or an employed structure, primarily because of how complicated practice is. So under this model, those burdens would almost disappear. And you don't see the kind of large group, massive group medical organizations elsewhere in the world that we've done to ourselves here in the United States. If you, there still would be some because people like me are crazy enough to want to do that, but you should do that only because you want to, not because you can't stand practicing any other way. So this is really important. And then lastly, of course, this would mean most every physician would be in network. We wouldn't have this definition of networks. So you know, today, when you pay your insurance premium, you're paying someone else to tell you which doctors you can't go to, right? If you have insurance, First thing you do before you go to see your physician is you look and see if they're in the directory. You search their name. You try to find and see if they're still in there. And even that's not a guarantee. But you try to find somebody who's in your network. That's crazy. Why should you have to do that? So, so there's this. So there's this bill we talked about, H.R. 676. Here's some news about this bill. It was introduced in 2003 by John Conyer, a representative from um, Michigan. And in 2003, you know, to your legislative cycles, 2003 when he introduced it, by the end of the term, it had 38 co-sponsors, and it grew. So that by 2008, at the end of that session, it had 93 co-sponsors, and we were all woo happy. Uh, it was the most popular health care reform bill before the ACA, in terms of almost getting, getting through. Then in 2009, of course, the ACA, or 2010, the ACA was enacted, and we started to see a drop-off. Um, so that actually last session, we had 62. And, uh, Three months ago, we had about 55 or 60 co-sponsors in uh, at the current legislature. The last two months have been amazing. We now have 95, 95. It's the biggest number ever, ever. So we have more um, US representatives co-sponsoring the bill to create Medicare for all than has ever happened in the history of the United States. So I, I do this. Pretty phenomenal. We have got five this week, I think. It's pretty phenomenal. So what? So what is? What are these words? You know, you've heard the phrase Medicare for all. I've been using that pretty extensively. You've also heard the phrase single payer. You've heard the phrase national health insurance (NHI). So, so can somebody explain to me the difference between Medicare for all, national health insurance, and single payer? Raise your hand if you can do it. And you can't because. So here's here's the situation, right? Here's us. 
We're all cartoons. We're all different shades of gray. Here's what we want. We want, a, we want medicine. We want pharmacy. We want, we want health care. And between us, of course, is money. Okay, And managing the money that's between us today is all, are all the payers, right? So the United States government pays for the Department of Defense, pays for post office employees, pays for the health care for all those folks, pays for Medicare, Medicaid. So there's the United States, there's the state, there's cities, there's uh, schools, there's businesses, and there's all the insurance companies. So those are all payers. So because of this, this is called a multi-payer model. This is called a multi-payer model. We're the only country in the world that has a multi-payer model. So what we're proposing is, and this is expensive, maintaining this is expensive. It's, so what we're proposing is getting rid of that and going to what's obviously a simpler system. So the words are synonyms. That's why you couldn't, that's why nobody raised their hand, aside from the fact that it's late in the afternoon. That's why nobody raised their hand. So, so it's a single payer because we, instead of having multi-payers, we would just have the one payer, so all that efficiency. Or you could call it national health insurance because it's health insurance for the nation. So it's national health insurance, a synonym. Or you could call it Medicare for all because the way we propose this, it would be taking Medicare and improving it and expanding it. So these are essentially synonyms that emphasize different aspects of it. It's kind of important to watch your language when you're talking about this. So if you're, if you're, talking, if you're, if you're saying single payer, Y'all know what a payer is now, but I'm gonna bet half of you 10 minutes ago weren't really quite sure what we meant by the word payer, and certainly not what we meant by a single payer. So you had an idea, but you didn't really, and most people you talk to won't really know what you mean exactly when you say a single payer. What's a payer? What's, so there's that phrase. Or national health insurance. Some people are put off by hearing the word national about something these days. So, you know, be thoughtful about that. Or Medicare, you know, the first thing you'll hear from well, a number of physicians until they learn more about this is, well, Medicare is awful. I see my patients with these copays and deductibles. And so we call it Medicare for all, but it's really important because that's, it's too long to say the whole name. But it's really important to have in your hip pocket when you're thinking about this. Really, we mean improved and expanded Medicare for all. So anyway, there's that language piece. So. This has been studied extensively. There have been, there's 25 studies on our, on our website that looked at this and that all came to the conclusion, all except for one that was partisan actually, um, that came to the conclusion that said that the savings would completely fund co-full coverage and most of them, almost all of them, said that you would come out ahead. So it said if you do this, if you do these things, that the cost it outweighs the, the expenses. So let's walk through all 25 of these studies in complete detail. Can you lock the door? No, we're gonna walk through one very high level. And this is all the, you no know, numbers, just you know, the green box is bigger than, the, no, we'll put some numbers on it. But, so here's the new costs and here's the new savings. This particular study is from uh, Gerald Friedman, who's the, um, head, was the head of the Department of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, and he's pretty published on this and, and other similar topics. And he said, yes, there would be new costs for doing Medicare for all. He said, first of all, you'd have to pay more $74 billion a year for Medicaid patients. So if I see you today in my office and you have, you have Medicaid, I'll get about 30 bucks in Missouri for seeing you. If I see you and you have Medicare, I'll get about 100 bucks for the same exact thing. And if I see you and you have Blue Cross, I'll get about 130 bucks for the exact same CPT code and the exact same ICD-9 codes. So, 30, 100, 130, I'm kind of making those numbers up there, the ballpark. But the, the point being, I'm doing retail, right? When I'm in practice and, and seeing patients, it's a retail operation. So I have to assess your economic value to me before I let you in my office. Not because I'm mean, but because I've got overhead, man. I've got overhead. And if I get less per patient than my overhead, I can do some of that because I'm a nice guy. But I can't, you, one of my favorite sentences is that you can't make up a negative margin on volume. You know, you just can't. So, so there's an issue. So we have to, I don't, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to biopsy your wallet before I let you into my practice. So we'd pay the same for everybody. So Medicaid patients, we'd, get, we, we'd have to pay more for those patients, the same for everybody. We'd cover the uninsured. There's a cost to that. And then everybody with this would start doing more because the benefits are better, so they'd go to the dentist which as I mentioned to, to someone out to, to outside, then people want to go to the dentist more than they want to go to me, more than they want to go to the physicians. They want the dentist because they're in pain. They want, so they'd start doing stuff, and the bill actually said it calls out specifically covering dentistry. So they would cover stuff. So the reason I'm sh showing you this is because there are analyses 
that, that stop here, right? Back, in, uh, back at the, uh, during the height of the primary season, that was happening a lot. There were articles in the USA Today and there were articles in the Wall Street Journal that literally just looked at these numbers and said, gee, it sounds great. I'm touchy-feely too. I want to give Medicare to everybody, but you know, we're in debt, man. We can't afford to take out more money from China. We're in debt. This is just irresponsible to do that. That's disingenuous. You have to look at this side when you're doing a, a fair assessment of this. We can still disagree about the philosophy and the strategy and the tactics and whether it's a good idea or the morality, whether there's a moral hazard. We can still disagree about all that stuff, but we should not let ourselves be sucked into an argument that's not based on facts and not the alternative facts, the real ones. So, so here's one analysis that says here's the savings. You have to look at them too. And one savings is the government administration. So instead of administering a couple dozen programs like governments do, there would be one program. So there would be a savings. And I'll show you what the expense of, um, of overhead of administering Medicare is. And you'll see why this is such a small number. But it's, but it's real, but it's relatively small. But there would be savings from that. There would be savings from health insurance administration, the administrative costs to hospitals and providers and all that. This stuff would get. so. If you think about that, does that mean that there's $215 billion windfall for all of us? Woo no, it doesn't. It means that the rates that we get paid would be appropriately adjusted to accommodate for that, but we'd stay whole. And I'll show you what that means near the end of this. But there would be savings from that. And then lastly, and this will be the topic for tomorrow if you come to tomorrow's session, um, it's just insane that Medicare can't negotiate the prices of drugs or devices. So this bill would include the charge to Medicare to do that, and there would be a savings from that. So like I said, there's about 25 of these studies, some at the state, some at the federal level, and they make different assumptions. They have different models. They put different buckets on things. So the numbers are different. But the worst, except for one, the worst shows break even, and the rest of them all show huge savings. So, so, we, so it shouldn't be an argument about can we afford to do that that's been studied. You also need to understand that you're already paying for this. We're all already paying for this. Private insurance is only paid for by about, only pays for about a third. Most of what is spent on health care today is funneled through taxes, public money. So it's not really typically seen. So tax subsidies, government worker benefits, VA, public health and stuff, Medicaid and Medicare. Now this is not the way you usually see this analysis. You usually only see Medicaid and Medicare when you see this. And so it looks like when you just look at those two parts of the pie, it looks like like public coverage is, is a lot, but it's not quite as much. Actually, if you look at it carefully, roughly two thirds of what we spend on healthcare today is actually out of the federal budget, out of, out of government um, budgets. So what does that mean? Well, how do we, we'll get to that, I guess. So why base this on Medicare? Why am I so hepped up about Medicare? Why build it on Medicare? And I'll show you a few reasons for this. First is this, um, life expectancy. So um, who has a longer life expectancy, a 65 year old or a 25 year old? I'm probably not asking this clearly enough, but who's like, let me be more clear. The, your life expect, if you're 65, you're not going to die when you're 20, right? So 65 year olds have longer total life expectancies than 25 year olds because the 25 year old has a fair chance of still dying when they're 30, 40, 50, and 60. And 65 year olds, it'd be pretty amazing to have a 65 year old who, so, so my point is that's not what we're talking about. 65, so as we get older, our life expectancies go up. And that's not what this chart is about. This chart is about life expectancy in the United States compared to 17 other peer nations, stratified by age, stratified by age. So here's 35-year-old Americans compared to 35-year-old of these 17, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, all these other countries. So here's our rank. So you already know, since we opened with life expectancy here is awful, you already know we're going to be down here, right? So that part's not the aha. Uh -huh. The rest of it is. This you didn't know, I'll bet, unless you were here. I don't remember if I said this last year or not. I don't remember when I came up on this. So when we hit Medicare age, life expectancy ranking of the Americans compared to other nations skyrockets so that we're nearly best in the, best in the world. I think we're number two. We're not, we don't get to number one. We're nearly, nearly best in the world. So maybe that's because we do so much feudal end-of-life care. I don't think that can get us up to number one. That's not, that's not it. 
Um, I don't know why it would be, other than we have a pretty darn good system called Medicare, and we have a pretty darn good delivery system called Y'all. If we can get in, if people can get in to see you, if they can afford to get rid of the barriers. So, so that to me, I could stop right here. To me, that's a compelling argument. It's also highly efficient. Here's overhead of the insurance companies, the, the bigger insurance companies, and overhead defined as um, medical loss ratio subtracted from 100, if you care, by SEC filings. So here's overhead. And as you know, the ACA compels them to be within 15 to 20 percent, depending on some things about it. So there's overhead. Overhead is about 18 percent for the insurance industry. And we want to hazard a guess for what Medicare's overhead is? Half? Half? 1.4 percent. One point, and that's from the Medicare Trust Fund report. And according to the report, that includes things like the brick and mortar for the, their buildings. It includes things like the salary for people working in the IRS, collecting the taxes that go in to fund it. It's all in. Uh, Don Berwick, who was the head of, uh, of Medicare for a while, said that he thought this number should be a little bit bigger, that there should be more money made available to Medicare for things like fraud and abuse and, and other programs. So they could, this should probably go up to maybe 2%. So that's traditional Medicare, Part A and B. If you add in Parts C and D, which, as you know, are privately administered, they're administered through the free market system, there's a lot more overhead because they compete and they have uh, advertising and all that. So they go up to, so total Medicare today is about 6% if you add all that together. So, so there's that. So it turns out that there's an experiment we can look at where we actually randomized, we picked two countries, and we gave them different approaches to health care. Us and Canada. So in 1971, United States and Canada were almost the same. I'm bringing this up because, you know, we're going to come to the conclusion that people live longer and do better in Canada in some ways. And people immediately respond to that by saying, well, it's Canada, for crying out loud. They're, they play hockey, and they're all the same. They don't have any of the issues that we have to deal with. They don't, you know, well, okay, then how come before 1971, we were the same. What happened in 1971? Before 1971, we had the same costs for health care as a percentage of GDP, and I'll show you this in a moment, on the same cost trend curve, and our life expectancies were a few months apart. So before 1971, we were almost the same as Canada. And then we did this experiment where Richard Nixon, President Richard Nixon, signed into law the HMO Act, ostensibly to reduce the cost of health care. So we started the managed care experiment. And Canada fully implemented, you know, it's been a process. I mean, they started it, you know, decades before that, and they didn't really finish it until, I think, sometime in the 80s, but they pretty much fully implemented it you know, in 1971. So it's almost like we had a fork, it is actually like we had a fork in the road. And what happened when we did that? Well, here's our costs as a percentage of GDP. You've seen that relentless curve. We're close to 19% now, I think it is. Here's 1971 when the HMO Act was signed to reduce the cost of health care. Didn't seem to do it very well. Okay, you've seen that curve before. Here's Canada's. This is the one you probably hadn't seen before. We were the same, and then we were different. And it wasn't just a drop in the y-axis, right, which is what you get if you negotiate something. It's a change in the slope of the curve. So very big impact. Now they're spending about half of what we spend. They have less unmet health care needs than we do today. And I don't have 1971 data to compare this to, but today, or a year ago when this survey was done, 14% of Americans said that they had an unmet health care need, and only 11% of Canadians. So there's that. What are these unmet health care needs? In the United States, 1% of Americans say that they have an unmet health care need because of a waiting list or a service that's unavailable in their community. 1%. But the biggest chunk is because of the cost of health care, and then a smattering of other reasons. In Canada, it's the waiting list. So if you've heard that there's a waiting list in Canada, you've heard correctly. There is. Uh, in most, many parts of Canada, there's a waiting list. But it's not for leukemia. It's for back pain. It's not for, it's not for pneumonia. It's for something else that can wait. I mean, my, my mother-in-law needs her hip replaced. And, and I know only too well that if we gave her a system that made her have to wait another week for her hip replacement, she would, she would be unpleasant. <laughs> So I'm glad she doesn't have to wait at all. Um, but it wouldn't kill her, right? On the other hand, you know, if you, my, I have a friend with, with leukemia in Michigan who, thank goodness, he has good insurance because he's a retired teacher. 
and he can, he can go anywhere. But if he couldn't, you don't want to have to wait when you have something. So Canadians don't wait for the life-threatening things, but they do wait for But remember, they spend half, half, half of what we spend. So of course they have some waiting issues. They don't have to, but they, but they do because of the, those decisions. Then 1% have an unmet health care need because of cost. It's not perfect. Um, the Canadian system, for example, does not include coverage for a pharmacy benefit. Um, there's, so there's other gaps. It's not perfect. And then they have the smattering of other reasons. But the most important argument to me is this one. Here's, this is 1979. I don't have comparative data from old enough to really go far enough back. But here, in 1979, Canadians were living about one year longer than we were. Canada minus the United States life expectancy. 1979 at birth. Can, Canadians were living a year longer than we were. And now they're living two and a half or three years longer than we are. So, so you know, we've got this experiment two arms, one arm is dying more and spending twice as much, and the other arm is living better, I'd say it's time to stop the experiment. So how do you, how do, you do this? How does this work out when you, when you do this? Um, when we did Medicare in the United States, here's how many physicians, this is one of the worries, right? If you put in a Medicare for all program, we're going to overload the system and, and you won't be able to get in to see your doctor. So what happened when we passed Medicare? The year before we passed Medicare in 1965, 840,000 visits to physicians in the United States. A year afterwards, 830,000 physicians. And I'll show you a little more granular data about that from Canada that may be illustrative. But we didn't exactly overload the system. Here's, here's the Canada data. So the year before and the year after the stuff we were just talking about, the same fork in the curve, they didn't have any change overall, measurable, significant change in the total number of visits. They did have a few more visits, to almost a 20% increase in visits among their lower income people. And as income goes up, they did have actually a, a decrement in visits. So a few less visits among the most wealthy and, and significantly more visits among the people who couldn't get access to health care. And overall, the system was, remained at homeostasis, so to speak. So that's kind of what happens when you do this. So we're going to get to the physician impact. But before we do, uh, Richard, if you would be kind enough to, uh, I'd like to stay in touch with you all. And, and if you give us your contact information, uh, we'll put it, I will put you onto our mailing list for PNHP. You don't have to be a physician again. Um, and, uh, and I'll send that information also to Richard so that you get onto um, the local uh, group that he's been so great at helping to organize, at, at organizing. So we want your, your mainly your, your, you know, this, this kind of stuff. If you, want, if you want another speaker from my organization, if you want me or somebody else to come, if you know another place we can go talk, check that box and I or one of my uh, colleagues will call you. If you know any of these kinds of places where you can put together a presentation about this, we're eager, eager to do more talks like this. So check that box and we will reach out to you about that. And then also be sure you get the little, the little handout. So, so there's that. Thanks. Okay, so what does this all mean for doctors? What does this all mean for physicians? And I don't have any dentistry data, and I'm sorry about that. But what does it mean for physicians? So first thing you should know is that we're a really miserable lot of people. <laughs> We are, physicians are the, in the United States, are the second, are, are almost the least satisfied physicians in the world. German physicians are actually less satisfied than we are, and it's, I don't know what that means. But, um, so we are, we're not a happy lot, and I think I can explain part of why that is. So our satisfaction varies with how much administrative stuff we have to do. So as we go higher and higher in administrative hours per week, we become less and less happy. So here's what a week for family medicine looks like in Canada. I figured that was a relatively mid-ground choice to make, but it's probably similar in most specialties. Family medicine, here's what the typical week um, looks like. Um, and then here's the non-clinical administrative time. Canadian physicians spend 2.4 hours per week on non-clinical administrative time. So again, here was us. And then there's Canada. So guess who's happier? <laughs> guess who's happier? And then here's another study doing a time motion study. And there's another one that came out this week that I didn't redundantly put in. But you know, showing that we spend way more time doing this stuff than we spend doing this stuff. And I don't know about y'all, but maybe, you, maybe it's different now. But I went to school to do this stuff, not to do this stuff. And I'll bet you did too. You are too. So there's that. How about income? There is what family physicians, there's what physicians um, build in Canada. And the billing in Canada is pretty much collections. And there's what billing is like in Canada. So pick your specialty. Pretty, 
pretty good. And remember, overhead in Canada is significantly lower than it is here because they don't have to spend eighty or ninety thousand dollars a year on somebody shuffling administrative papers for the insurance companies. They don't have to do that. Um, malpractice is significantly lower. Twenty-five. You know, you you go talk to a state legislator here in Missouri about anything, and you identify yourself as a physician, and the first reaction you're going to get, which is the reaction I get the first time I go talk to any of them, is, I know, malpractice, I know, malpractice, I know, malpractice. Um, and you have to kind of break through that. This doesn't happen anywhere else because it's not, why do people sue their doctor? They sue because there was a bad outcome, and they're worried about things like the future cost of medical care. Bad outcomes, those are going to happen, that's part of life. But, but the future cost of medical care in every other nation they don't, they're not, you know, here you have something happen to your health, you're going to, you, you very possibly are going to lose your job, and you're very possibly are going to lose your health insurance, and you're very possibly going to have some huge financial problems. So people here um, sue sometimes because they don't have any other way to fund the future cost of their health care, although we'll talk about that a little bit more. So the reason to sue, to acquire coverage for the future cost of health care goes away, so, so they're less litigious for a few reasons, but that's one. And then if they do sue and the finding is the judgment is against you, here the biggest single piece of the judgment is to pay for the future cost of medical care. So if they do sue, if they're less likely to sue, and if they do sue, the finding against you will be a fraction of what it is here. At the end of the day, malpractice in Canada is a fraction of what it is here. There's also this piece, right? The average physician, according to the Missouri State Medical Association, the average, thank you for that, Missouri State Medical Association, the average physician in the United States has more than, in Missouri has $200,000 in accounts receivable. What is accounts receivable? That's not charity work. You write off charity work. It's not free care that you decided to give. This is something that you build, you did the work, you build the insurance company, because you think there was an insurance company, and you build them, and you expect to get paid, and you haven't gotten paid, and the average physician in Missouri uh, has over two hundred thousand dollars in accounts receivable, and it's twelve months old. They're not getting it. They're not getting it. Then they eventually it just gets written off. This doesn't happen in Canada, and this is getting more and more difficult because people are more and more having these high deductible health plans and having having a big part of accounts of, of being personally responsible for the payment. And that hits us, right? We're the ones on the front line when the patient has one of these health plans and doesn't pay. So we're coming up with all these strategies. So you're seeing high deductible health plans, right? What is that? Consumer-driven health plans, high deductible health plans, catastrophic insurance. These are all synonyms. These are basically having a high deductible. Some people will say, well, it's not a high deductible. Think about it as the consumer is more engaged because it's, they've got skin in the game. So it's consumer-driven. Consumer-driven health plans are synonyms for high deductible health plans, which are synonyms for catastrophic health plans. Those are the same thing. And all of that means more bad debt for you and me. So physicians more and more now are, are turning to these strategies. So on a recent survey, I think it was on LinkedIn actually, 6% steer patients intentionally, if they, if they have a high deductible health plan, we are intentionally steering patients to less expensive providers in our group. Or, to, or they're requiring the deductible to, to be met before they'll do a procedure uh, or other things or hire team members just for this. Like hiring, we're hiring more financial counselors. We're requiring payment up front. We're offering, we physicians are offering payment programs or a third of us are still not doing anything about it. But, but two thirds of us have started to do some kind of a strategy because of how much worse our bad debt is becoming. So under a national health insurance program, you wouldn't have to do any of that. You wouldn't have to do any of that. So here's one example, uh, uh, Dr. What's his name? I forgot his name. Uh, Dr. Zolzala. He pointed out that he couldn't stand this problem when he was practicing in Detroit area, and so he moved to Canada, where this is just essentially um, unheard of. It doesn't happen there. So as a result, he's not alone. American physicians have been leaving the United States and going to Canada for the last 10 or 15 years. Did you know that? American physicians have been leaving and going to the country that they say, oh, socialism. No, it's not socialism, it's Medicare. But they've been leaving and going to Canada. And Canadian physicians have been repatriating Canada. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? And we all know, you know, Dr. So-and-so from Canada who came here 30 years ago and he couldn't stand Canada's healthcare system and he's got 
grayer hair than I do. Um, because it was a thing, it's not a thing now. The Canadian physicians are, are repatriating. So um, how else would it affect? So it would decrease your administrative burden, it would increase your satisfaction, and it would preserve your earning potential. So that's why, um, oh yeah, this, is, this just came out last week. I'm sorry, you're the first group for me to show it to. This LinkedIn survey that said that, that almost half, on this survey, almost half, uh, previous surveys have made it look like 59% um, of physicians, this is a lar much larger survey, um, and 59% of physicians uh, wanted uh, a Medicare for All type program. Um, it varies by specialty, um, and I can see some patterns there, but I won't belabor that with you, but it varies by specialty. So even in the least favorable specialties, you know, the, the terrible, terrible, no good Dr. James Adams specialty, so even, even, even in, the, in the specialties that are the least inclined towards it, um, there's still almost a third of physicians there that, that are in this camp. So most physicians get this. Um, they, they want it to happen. So where's the moral high ground? So, I mean, I hope I didn't come across like this because um, people with whom I disagree, I think, have just as much reason to have their point of view, not facts, but reason. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about how you pick your words when you're talking about things. Yeah, I'm going to skip this. So we talked. We, actually, we talked about this already. So I'm going to skip that. Sorry, I didn't remember that I put that in there. So let's go to two models about how people think about things. Here's one. Who's heard of George Lakoff? Oh, good. Well, bad. You should shame on you. You should know this. So, um, so I grew up in a medical family. I, you know, went to medical school. I practiced with, guess what, other physicians. And, and, and so I kind of, and most of them agreed with this stuff. And I didn't know very many people who were really, and I, I'll confess, you probably figured it out. I've got sort of a liberal progressive orientation. Um, and I didn't know that many people that had significantly different points of view from mine. I didn't, I didn't. Um, and I had them characterized, pigeonholed, cartooned as, as a number of things, which turns out not to be the case at all. And then I went to work at Express Scripts, as I mentioned, and guess what? The, the liberal progressive point of view was really not very common. There's 14,000 employees, and three of us are progressives. Um, so no, not, not really. But it, but it turns out that I was surrounded by people with whom politically I disagreed, and all of those cartoons and stereotypes I had in my head were shattered because I. They, these were, these, you know, some, some, a lot of conservatives are, well, both parties, both groups, liberals and conservatives, can be very intelligent, very compassionate, very informed, know an awful lot about history, not be, you know, so if you think that you have the moral high ground on that for whichever side you're on, because you've been exposed to one and not the other, whichever one it is, you need to know about the, some of this stuff. So I couldn't understand it. I couldn't quite come to grips, and that's when I met George Lakoff's book, not George Lakoff, I met his, met his book. This book is called Moral Politics, and he's a neurolinguist from uh, Stanford. And this book, there's a shorter one called Don't Think of Elephants, but there, this book I think is the best, and it's, it's a thick book. Um, the first half of this book is apolitical. It just goes through what I'm about to tell you about um, how people think about stuff from a neutral point of view. It talks about liberals and conservatives, and he doesn't take a position on it. And I gave this book to a lot of these folks with whom I so much disagreed, and they validated to me that this first half of the book did accurately represent how they thought. So I recommend it to you. It might help you kind of figure some of this out. The second half of the book is an explanation of why one side's right and one side's wrong, so there's that. But the first half is really, a, is really an, a, a, an aggressively apolitical discussion about this stuff. Um, so anyway, oops, wrong button. So he says, Sorry. So he says that there's conservatives, right, who have these as sort of some of their most important political priorities. And then there's liberals who have these as some of their most important priorities politically. And I always had a hard time kind of understanding how some of that stuff fit together. So I didn't quite get it. And then there's independence, and we sort of think this about independence. Oh, they're, they're just, they don't know what they're doing. They don't care. They're uninformed. And, and it turns out that's really not true. That's really not true. So he's got this model that, um, he's a neurolinguist at Stanford. I guess he's got some evidence for it. He calls this group, his words, again, not mine, he calls this group strict fathers. And, uh, and he, the way he describes this, uh, people who have that mindset, um, have a very hierarchical structure in their head, 
where it's man, no, it's God, man, woman, child, animal, plant, rock, basically. And anything that you would do that would disrupt that natural order would actually be very destructive to society as a whole. If you make it easier to be lower in moral character, you've actually threatened the nature of society, and maybe Medicaid expansion would save lives, but it would be so destructive to society that it would do way more harm. So that's why some of the, 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 the very conservative folks um, are okay with not getting the life-saving value of Medicaid expansion because they think it's really actually more important not to rock the social order. So and I'm trying to say this in as neutral way as I can because there's people I disagree strongly with but whom I respect a great deal too. So that's how they think. And I've had this validated time and again. So there's this school of thought. And then there's what he calls the nurturant mother. Again, his, his terms, nurturant mother, where this group is much more focused on, you know, Mozart might be sitting in the next crib. You know, we got to get everybody and we got to treat everybody the same and, and, and kind of, you know, nurture everybody because that's sort of the right thing to do. So there's that. And then he says that biconceptuals is what he calls this group. These are people that have both of these frames, he calls them frames, in their head all the time. So it's not that they're independent or uninformed or they don't care, it's that they have both ways of thinking. And think about this, you know people who are only here, you do, you know people who are only here, and you know people who are only here and don't get those things. The point is, if, you, if, if, it, if you're saying something to somebody and they don't have the frame in their head for it, they're not going to hear you. You're speaking Italian and they speak Hindi. You're not going to get through to them. It's just no communication. So the reason this is meaningful is because he says that 20% of people are only one frame or the other, but that the overwhelming majority of people actually have both of these frameworks in their head. So if you're here and you're trying to argue about politics with somebody who's there and you figure out that they're there, walk away um, or use some of the next tricks or use some of the tricks that I'm about to show you. Or, but, but you're not going to get through to these people very well. If you're talking to somebody who's here and you're coming, and you're coming from this perspective and you're talking to somebody who's here, try to activate something about, about the the, the strict father, the, the hierarchical thing in their head, because they probably have something of that in their head. And so try to get them thinking, use those arguments, because they'll, they'll get through. So there's this. I found that very interesting. I hope you did too. <laughs> so um, then there's this other piece that's a little bit more recent by Jonathan Haidt. Um, raise your hand if you've heard of Jonathan Haidt. Nope, OK. So I'm glad I'm showing it to you. Jonathan Haidt uh, has done online surveys of well, when this was published, 130,000, but now it's significantly higher. But uh, this data I'll show you was drawn from 130,000 online surveys uh, where he um, first assessed people's political standing from the very conservative to the middle to the very liberal. And then he found their moral values, so to speak. And he's identified what he calls five moral pillars. And he shows the relationship between how much you value each of these moral pillars with where you are politically. So what are these pillars? Fairness, reciprocal altruism. I washed your back because you're going to wash mine, so we all help each other. Reciprocal altruism, justice, fairness. Um, caring, a separate, a measurably separate and discrete moral value. Empathy, kindness, caring, loyalty, patriotism. Um, one for all, all for one, loyalty. Uh, authority, you know, deference to leadership, respect for traditions, and sanctity. Um, bodies are temples. So these are five, he's actually got, I think, six now, but these are the five moral values that he's identified. Um, here's where it gets interesting. Very liberal people, on his measurements, come out really high on fairness. So this is why you'll see um, a lot of uh, liberals talking about health care for all stuff. They'll show pictures of all the CEOs of large insurance industries and their salaries, and they'll rail about how unfair it is that they're making so much money. And, you know, I can kind of relate to that, you know, $25 billion, million dollars for, seems like a lot of money, but, but th they think that that by itself is all you need to do for the argument because fairness is the value. Or caring, you know, you know this system, uh, look at the deaths. You know, the system is just uncaring, it's, un it's unjust. So caring is a form. We don't, I'm the, uh, people very liberal don't tend to value loyalty nearly as much. 
That's, you know, you have to kind of earn it. It's not just, you know, naturally loyal. Uh, or authority. You know, authority doesn't come automatically. And we really not so hot on this oftentimes. So the very liberal, that's where they score when you do 130,000 um, surveys. Go over to the other side here. They still endorse fairness. They still endorse caring, but not quite as much. Not quite as much. So if you're standing over here, looking over there, you're seeing less fairing and careness. Less, yeah, that's right. Less fairness and caring. You're seeing less, <laughs> and none of you noticed that. Did you? You're seeing less, <laughs> it's like when John Oliver puts up a map and it's not the right country. You're, you're, seeing less, <laughs> you're seeing less fairness and caring, and you think that you know, they're just uncaring, un, un, uncare and unfairing. And so there's that. So loyalty, authority, and sanctity score much higher over there. So if you're over here, looking over there, you know, you get that, so, you know, right, they, they care, you know, bleeding heart, you know, but they, but they don't have any of these other moral values. So who's right? Who's right? Which one's right? Um, most folks are, oh, really? Thanks. <laughs> now what are we going to do? So, so the, so if you, I think I've got, yeah, okay. So if you're trying to talk about this issue and you're on one side or the other, think about fairness as a human right, right, okay? Think about protecting them. But if, you, if, you're, if this is all you're saying, people who, are, who don't value that as much as they do these priorities are going to not resonate with you. You're going to be put, you know, that's, that's why liberals drive conservatives crazy, and that's why conservatives drive liberals crazy. So loyalty, I would say that you, it's, we should all be sensitive to this. I, you know, we, we, we want to be, you know, we want to compete and be the best. So be loyal, but not just to your family, not just to your neighborhood, not just to your community. Be loyal. You know, the country should be doing better. So loyalty should be directed at, at getting the best health care, maybe the species, but, you know, loyalty. Authority, well, there's an awful lot of faith leaders that you could be quoting if you wanted to talk about this. Or sanctity, you know, uh, preventing needless pain and suffering. So there's that. So my last thing, who's this guy? Anybody know? Winston Churchill. All right, good. You can always count on Americans to do the right thing after we've tried everything else. Yeah, okay. So, oh, yeah, how, so how do we do this? You might want to know. So I submit to you that the first most important thing, uh, again, is to protect what's important in the ACA. I think that, you know, the ACA is far from a perfect solution. I could spend the entire hour talking about things that are terrible about the ACA, but it did do this, right? We do have 20 million more Americans that have less financial barriers to healthcare than they used to. I think that's a thing that we don't want to mess up, uh, and lower income folks have a more level playing field, so there's that. And there's important insurance industry reforms. 26-year-olds have insurance, and there's other things. So. ACA is far from perfect, and if you want to repeal it and replace it, at least make sure that you don't mess with these sorts of things. So there's that. And then I would say that we want to move forward to this, improve it and expand it. The best way to protect Medicare from all the attacks that are going on against it, the privatization and all that, is to make sure everybody has it. Um, the question is, do you do an abrupt leap? Do you want to go to a national health insurance, a Medicare for All program overnight? Or do you do it uh, incrementally? Um, and that's some of what we're going to talk about tomorrow, actually there's tomorrow. So if you're, if you're able to, come. And I think that's, yeah, and sign your name to the email list. So come tomorrow. <clears throat>
and every time it's been tried, it hasn't worked very well. Um, it's been underfunded because it's, again, a fragment of the population, so it gets underfunded and it just doesn't work, but it helps the insurance industry because it pulls off the people that are the most expensive to take care of. Take care of. So I guess if it were really well funded, you know, but it makes no sense. It's, for, it's marginalizing the people who most need um, health care, so there's that. HSAs, if you think about this, the, the logic of a health savings account is that we'll get Americans to put more skin in the game. Because if, if it's your nickel, if you're the one paying for the health care, then you're going to force your doctor and your hospital to be transparent and tell you what the prices are so that you can then make an informed decision. And that's the strategy, is, is to have... The problem is the marketplace hasn't been able to do this because we've insulated people and people can drive towards the most uh, appropriate and cost-effective strategy if they were if it was their money that they were spending. So what does that mean? That means that every individual American is supposed to then figure out a quality metric about the place or else they have no way of telling the value and they're supposed to comparison shop all of these things and the most important time to do that of course is when you're having your stroke because that's really expensive so they have to do it when they're really sick and these individual people um, like you and me and everybody are going to be better at that process because it's our money than the insurance industry today who has career actuaries and career negotiators and full-time people whose only gig is to do the thing that we're asking the guy who works in the gas station to do better. How is that supposed to work? I don't, I don't even understand the logic of that. I'd see, you know, it's, and so when something to me makes absolutely no sense, and this is again, now, now we're getting, this is my opinions, we're not, I'm not showing you data, it's my opinions, it's logic, it's my reasoning, it might, might be wrong, but this is how it makes, works for me. So, so I think when I run into something that makes no sense like that, follow the money. And the money is, of course, that that's stuff that the insurance companies can offload. Employers then can offload. It's transferring costs over to people and away from these insurance entities that then would stay in business but not have to spend as much. I don't know. I don't really know. But it, it makes zero sense to me as a strategy, just logically. Do you have a different point of view on it? No, I mean, you know, different, different issues there. You know, another issue is just... Uh, so you've got a health savings account, but let's say you don't have a job, you don't have a lot of money, you know, how, how are you going to pay it into that? That's kind of be an advantage for those who make a lot of money and don't need tax write-offs, that kind of thing, a little bit. So you could, I mean, now I'll argue from the more conservative point of view, you could, if you think an HSA strategy is a good one, you could deal with that issue by saying if you're below a certain level of income, we're going to actually pre-fill your HSA with a certain amount of dollars that then you could use towards whatever. So you could... You could kind of mitigate that. Um, so to me, the compelling argument is that it makes no sense. Other than the fact that it makes no sense, I'm all for it. <laughs> Who disagrees with this? Tell somebody, if you, believe me, if you knew uh, the way I was brought up, my family, my, you, know, you, you would believe, you would believe that I'm okay with you not agreeing with me. Please, tell me why this is all crazy and we should do something totally other than this and I'm not, you know, it's fine. I don't disagree with what you said about the Shut HSAs, yeah, you know. <laughs> but there was one aspect that I do like about them that didn't seem to be touched on, and this is just from my one experience working where I was offered an HSA, and basically there were incentives for me to live a healthier lifestyle, mm. which would mean I would earn, or would result in me earning more towards my HSA that I wouldn't have to contribute towards my employer would contribute toward it for me being healthy. And so with a growing aging population and lots of chronic illnesses and how that is becoming expensive for the healthcare industry, I think that, I mean, I thought it was an interesting way to address that issue. So, and, and I, I think that's not an unreasonable thing to be saying. Um, so why do people, so why, why would you give, some, so one of the things that people do for wellness sometimes is they give them money to quit smoking. Sure. So I'm pretty sure if you quit smoking, you already have money um, from not smoking, not buying the cigarettes. So my, the, I'm using that as an example of the fact that financial incentives are actually the least effective of all the ways we can change people's um, behaviors. So. Okay. 
Um, behavioral economics shows you all kinds of more effective ways that don't almost cost anything. I just want to clarify, I'm not disagreeing with single payer or anything. It was just one little detail about HSAs that yeah. wasn't mentioned, so I wanted to you know, hear more yeah. about that, so thank you. But it's okay not to like the idea of single payer. I'm, I'm, I'm here telling you my opinion, I'm showing you data, but it's okay not to like this. Uh, I, don't, I don't disagree either. Uh, I just had a question about, so if you did move to this plan of a national health care, uh, what would happen to all these big companies that have a lot of influence over the industry? So the companies or the employees? Um, both, actually. Both I mean, yeah. So um, let's do the employees first, and then let's talk about the impact on the company. So um, the employees, um, you know, I, don't know, I don't have a number of how many people there are working in the insurance industry, but I'm sure it's north of 100,000, but I don't have a, a number for it. Um, and they would be very disrupted by this. So. A um, few things to think about that side of it. The first is that most of the people in jobs that would be disrupted by this, those are, um, those are not great jobs. And I don't mean that as an insult. I mean that they're not great jobs. And the way I define that is that these are jobs with more than 25% annual turnover. People in the job quit within a year. 25% quit within a year. Which means that no matter what you do today, March, April 14th, no matter what you do today, April 13th, I guess, no matter what you do today, Two years from now, more than half of the people in the jobs that we're talking about aren't going to be in those jobs because they're not great jobs. So there's that. Another thing to think about for, and, so, and the bill actually talks about that. The bill says uh, if you're in a job that's disrupted by this, uh, for two years after the bill is passed, you have a guaranteed income of up to $100,000 a year. No matter what happens to your employer, you're not going to lose, you're guaranteed of your salary preservation up to $100,000 a year plus job retraining, plus at the end of that two-year period, eligibility for unemployment starting then. So there's quite a bit of thought about that. But more importantly, um, countries that do this find that other industries need more employees because it's easier to run another business. Come tomorrow and you'll see a couple of examples of this. It's easier to run a business when you don't have to be straddled with this unpredictably escalating uh, cost of providing a health insurance benefit. So, there's employers um, in, in other countries. In Canada, there's a, there's, a, there's a manufacturer, just as an example, who wants to move to the United States because most of his customers are in the United States, and he'd reduce shipping costs. And so it would be a better, more affordable product for him if he could move to the United States. But he can't because it would cost him, I think he said, $2 million more in health care benefits if he had to provide health care benefits here compared to in Canada. And the auto workers, you know, in Canada, they negotiate on salary, not on benefits, or on wages, and not on benefits. So, so in general, other jobs would be, would, the, all the modeling from, from most economists say, say that other jobs would, would do well, would, would, would have, it would be a good jobs strategy. So, so the employment piece, I'm not particularly worried about. The, the companies themselves, that's the issue, is that this is truly an existential threat to most of them under the way I spelled it out. So that's one model where it's Medicare with no private insurance intermediary. There's another model that's done in several countries around the world too, which was just too much detail to start with, but we're further along now. So they have, so we have a, we have a multi-payer, they have what we call a single payer, but there's another model called an all-payer, which we consider a subset of single payer, but under that model you, you still have lots of insurance companies actually. You do. Germany has lots of insurance companies. We think of them as a single-payer country because it's all federally organized, federally regulated very strongly. Uh, as I understand it, the benefits amongst these insurance companies are all identical. The networks are all comprehensive and identical, and the premiums are all identical. I'm not quite sure how they compete, but, but, they, but you could set that up. They're all intensely nonprofit and, and intensely regulated by, by their government, um, but they do exist. So you could go to that. Um, the insurance industry in the United States would oppose that as strongly as they oppose what we want. Uh, Germany uh, is, uh, is, if you look at countries in general, they're half as expensive as the United States. Most other countries are about half of what we spend. Germany is at the upper end of that cluster, but they're still way lower than we are. So if we decided we wanted to go to this all-payer model instead of a single-payer model because it at least gives some niche for the insurance industry, I would, that's a great middle ground compromise as far as I'm concerned, but there's no reason to push for that because it's not as good. Um, so 
But I mean, it is that, that what you're asking about is you know you've got this the insurance industry and it is a big deal because they represent one sixth of the economy, and so you know it's, it's a little scary to think about putting in a system that would change one sixth of the economy. So it wouldn't change it overnight. I mean, there's a two year implementation period. It wouldn't do that overnight. You could say, well, we we didn't have that problem when we passed Medicare, but the insurance industry wasn't as big a part of the economy when we did that. Um, so. And they wanted it somewhat because it got rid of their worst, you know, their worst risk cases. So it's a big, and that's why there's talk about transitional steps rather than making the abrupt leap across the chasm to this, to do transitionally. And that's a little bit about what gets talked about tomorrow. Um, that's why some people talk about going from age 65 to age 60 to age 55, that approach. So there are, or you could say Medicare today covers dialysis and it covers Lou Gehrig's disease, you could say, why doesn't it cover cancer? Why doesn't it cover heart? You could add diseases on, you could expand, you could, you could incrementally go towards this. Any of the incremental strategies would be less disruptive, but would be way more expensive, because as I said early on, you don't get the savings until you actually get rid of the bureaucracy that's wasteful, and you have to kind of get rid of it to, to make it effective. So, is that kind of what you're asking about? Okay, good. All right, so realistically, what would it take for HR 676 to go through, and what would you have to do to make it happen? Um, so to make, to make this bill happen, we, we need a sea change in Congress. Um, or we have a president who is, uh, I find very difficult to predict what he does. Um, and he has, in the past, actually spoken in favor of this. I suspect if he came on board saying, let's do this, it would have a big impact. I don't know. I don't think that's, I don't think that's very likely, but uh, we need something legislative to change. So it's, it's, it's not going to happen because we elect a president who supports this. We did that, right, in 2008. We elected a president who, when he was a state senator, was overtly, aggressively, well-informed, educated, and advocating for Medicare for all. And then he didn't pursue it because there wasn't the nation pushing him towards it. You know, every president says, I can't just do these things. You have to push me to do these things. And that's why I'm here. <laughs> that's why, you know, a year or two from now, you should be giving this, this talk to other groups. You know, that's why, you know, we have to keep it. But be a really good cheer because, you know, record high number of people supporting it these days. So there's that. So it needs a change in the legislature. Um, we, we have to get Republicans to be signing off on it. Um, it just has to happen. It, if, if it's just a one-party bill that goes through, it'll remain contested forever again. And my God, I don't want to see that happen again. I don't want to see that it go that way. I want to see it happen because we actually figure out the common ground and we stop having these fights. That's why I showed that little part about how conservatives and liberals think, because I think it's incredibly important that we not let the few extreme crazies who make it look like we can't communicate dominate the room. It's really important that we treat our Uncle Louie, who's kind of crazy, with respect, and that we have these discussions and we find that common ground and talk about things like prudence and loyalty and such and these issues and realize that when somebody from the progressive side is saying, healthcare for all, it's a human right, realize that you're pissing off people who could be your allies because they hear other things than we do. So I think, I think what it takes is for us to be more smart, be, be more smarter about how we talk about stuff and, and then make a sea change where we demand that our legislature uh, does it. It could also happen at a state level, right? California, this is really interesting. California, uh, when Schwarzenegger was, made, was governor of California, Cali of California, twice the state legislature passed a state-specific single-payer bill, and Schwarzenegger vetoed it. And then Brown came in office, and until just recently, a new change, until just recently, um, he was in favor of the bill, and so, the, so um, Amgen and Wellpoint descended on the state legislature and said, hey, when Schwarzenegger was mayor, was governor, we didn't care if you wanted to play with that thing because he had our back and he, wasn't, he, wasn't, he was going to veto it. But Brown says he's going to sign it. So if you pass this bill again, you're going to have to find alternate ways to fund your next campaign. And so for a few years now, the California legislature hadn't even submitted a state-specific single-payer bill, let alone pass one like they've done twice. 
I don't know if you know, the last couple, three weeks, there's a new bill in California to make California the first state specific single payer bill. And that's huge because they've passed it twice before. And it's huge because it's not Vermont. If Vermont had actually done that, which would have been wonderful, I think, but if Vermont had actually done that, it would have been frigging Vermont, you know? It would have been, yeah, Vermont did it. If California does it, we're gonna say they're crazy. You know, it's little crazy Californians, you know, they don't, can't, make, can't make it work in Missouri, you know, California, but they're really big. If they can do it in California and make it, pass it and make it work, um, States around Washington State's going to Oregon. There, these other states that are around there will have to do it. That's exactly what happened in Canada. Saskatchewan did it, and then the, the neighboring provinces said, "Hey, what about us? You know, should I move to Saskatchewan, or why don't we get our act together over here?" So, a state doing it first um, could be huge. Now they can't actually do it because there's things about the way the law is written that a state can't be a robust true single-payer plan, but they can come close enough that we can really kind of get most of the political bang out of it. So, so I think a state like California doing it, this is huge. Uh, Colorado's going to try again. There's all these, you know, there's I think like 13 states that are, you know, either trying or thinking about trying, trying it. So a state-specific strategy wouldn't be literally single-payer, but be really close, and I think that's another transitional way. Plus, that doesn't disrupt one-sixth of the economy. It disrupts California. Um, so I, I, I think it's doable. Um, and what's more, the other, the last thing, and then I'll stop haranguing you, the last thing about this, this is that um, every political change seems completely impossible two years before it's done, right? Uh, Americans with Disability Act, well, of course we want to have disabled folks able to work in, in the environment, but do you want to retool all those sidewalks? Do you want to retool all that you want to build? You know, how much you know how expensive that is? You know how businesses today are struggling and you want to build? I'd love to, but, you know, uh, clean air. Of course I want, I breathe, of course I want clean air, but the smokestacks, you want to rebuild all the smokestacks? You want to scrub all that stuff? We can't afford it. I don't like Lake Erie catching fire either, but... <laughs> You know, they're always, they're always seem to be entrenched economic mammoths that would not make it, would, 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 that'll make it impossible to do two years before it's done. And then it's like, why didn't we do that 10 years ago? So I give this talk to, to uh, a lot of Rotary Clubs, actually. Um, and, and I walk into the room, and they're sitting there, you know, this is Kami Pinko Fag talking to me. You know, he's there. <laughs> there because they have to have a talk, and so they let me come in sometimes. And within 20 minutes, um, at the end of the 20 minutes, that's all they give me, at the end of the 20 minutes, the most common question that I get is, why haven't we already done this? So the surveys that show that people support this, the majority of Americans support this, it's absolutely true, and the majority of Americans aren't even that well educated about it, and as they get more educated about it, and they learn some of the uh, myth-dispelling facts that I uh, hope I've shared with you, um, people want this, and it's just it's it's up to us to say enough. We can't stand it. Stop this nonsense. Repeal and replace. Well, we can build on the ACA. There's transitional ways to get to this from the ACA, but let's just do it. Let's get there. So it's up to us to demand it, which means all y'all learning more, joining our organization, signing up with Richard's group, learning more and speaking more. Don't be embarrassed about it. Uh, I was afraid to start talking about uh, Medicare for all uh, six years ago, and I'll bet some of you are today because I spent my entire career trying to build what I thought of as my personal brand of the competent, hardworking, caring physician. That's who I was. And then for a while, I was also the smart business guy. That's who I was. And I didn't want to disrupt that by being branded as one of those few lunatics who wants to talk about Medicare for all. I didn't want to tarnish this image. And then I got the data that shows that 59% of my colleagues actually agreed with me actually agreed with me, and then I, because I got a little more into it, I got the list of people in my town who had already joined the organization. There were some people there who I've never talked about with this, and I, and I went up to some of them and said, hey, Brian, you know, I, you're, <laughs> really, you think about this? And, and, and it turns out that we're in the majority. We're not just this little crazy, so you can talk about this and, and do it in a respectful way, because not everybody's going to agree with you, and there, there's nothing wrong with that. Do it in a respectful way, but have the conversation. Have the conversation. Talk about it. You know, you don't want to harangue your patients, but you know, if your patients bring something up, you know, you can you can endorse it. Yeah. So anyway, that's a long answer to your to your good question. We have about five minutes left. Um, HR six seventy six. Does it have like provisions to have separate um, private insurance? 
companies? Because most of these uh, national health com countries, they still have private health insurance for premium services, or if you don't want to wait for your backache, you can get like in the, um, for get services faster kind of a thing? So, so, so two things. Uh, yeah. So first is, um, and, and you're correct, uh, if you all, all heard, uh, you said that uh, many other nations that have uh, a national health insurance program, um, they actually do have a private insurance model running parallel to this, so that some people do purchase private insurance because they don't like whatever and they do purchase this. So that's true, and that would probably always be true, um, but what you need to know about that group is that it's typically, it's almost always, less than 5% of that country's spend on health care. It's less than 5% of that country's spend on health care. So, you know, the particularly wealthy folks are always going to find some other system to do what they want to do. And, and the good news is you don't actually have to impede that to, to have this all happen. So uh, it's true, but it's like pocket change. It's not, it's not really on the budget for the national health care plan. So there's that. The other thing is you, you specifically asked about what does the bill say about that. And the bill, as written today, specifically calls out that insurance companies are precluded from selling an insurance policy that replicates the core benefits that are embedded in H.R. 676. So th the bill, as it's written today, specifically calls out that you can't sell an insurance product that replicates the benefits that are in. So you can't sell an insurance policy that pays for um, ambulatory care, that pays for the pharmacy benefit, that pays for this, that, or the other thing. But you could sell an insurance policy that says when I go to the hospital, I only get a private room. You could do that. You probably couldn't sell a policy that says when I need an MRI, I go to the front of the line because that's exactly what we don't want to have happen. On the other hand, you know, if you don't want it, you could, there's, there, it's probably impossible to stop an MRI service from taking, you know, unmarked bills from, you know, if, if you want to just pay cash for something, it's probably impossible to make that not happen. And I don't know, that, and again, the point being, we don't have to make that not happen. This, this doesn't have to be perfectly designed and perfectly implemented to get the 99% of the bang for the buck out of it. So, so is that sort of what you're asking? The bill says absolutely not, but you know, it's, it's 30 pages. So there would probably be a lot more ifs, ands, or buts, you know, written into it when it gets further. But I think it's really important to preserve the idea that there are not two tiers of health care in our country. So that's just ineffective and not right. Richard, back to him. So what I have seen in uh, those countries is that um, private health competes with the government system, try to reduce the cost. So why do you take it out from? Because um, so, usually... Say that again, private reduces... Private health the insurances they usually have better terms than U.S. private health insurances because they have to compete with the government subsidized health care system. So why uh, take that out from the, um, the market? Yeah, so you could, but again, you don't get quite the savings because you still have the bureaucratic administrative issues that go along with it. So you don't get quite the savings that you would if you didn't have that going on. So there's that. Um, and there's, there's no reason that, you know, empowering the government to negotiate that they couldn't, you know, that they couldn't do a splendid job at this. You know, many other countries do it that way. Yeah. I think we're almost done. Plus, I think there, there's research out there with countries that have done that, that have, you know, the, the public and the private system. The private system is only there to make money. So the more they're in the system, the more they're draining resources and the more problems that, that, that that country has. I think us, it, I have too much trouble remembering the study in, in Australia. I think they did that. And the more that they got the private uh, insurance in their system, the more problems they got. In Germany, you know, you, you notice that Germany is kind of an outlier as far as single payers go, and they're not so happy, and, they're, and they've got the private system in there that, that can be elected for in, in that country. The, in general, when you have you know, more and more private like that in, that in those public systems, they get more and more problems. What I was thinking about was that you live where they have the national health system, but if you have a good job, you can get a, a good health uh, insurance, and you just skip the line and you go to different hospitals. There are like big, different hospitals like that, which serves uh, private insurance clients. Still, the system uh, works. I mean, in uh, uh, the 
national health system in England it has like a lot of good performance standards compared to a lot of U.S. states. But they've embarked on a pathway that is actually corrosive to the value that they created when they created the NHS. So by, by doing that, as, as Dr. Adams was saying, they're, they're filtering off the wealthier patients, which then undermines the commitment that those wealthier folks have to preserving this system. And the more you bifurcate it like that, the more that slowly but inexorably leads to having Medicaid and, and Blue Cross. And Medicaid is better, way better than nothing, but we don't really want a program like that for everybody. We want a good program for everybody. So the more you go down that road, that's, that's, the free market isn't going to control costs on it. Come tomorrow, because that's the whole topic tomorrow, really. OK, well, I would like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, thank you to SGA for co-sponsoring this event. And of course, thank you, Dr. Weisbart, for uh, coming to speak. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks. And of course, uh, part two of uh, the series is tomorrow in IPE 241 at noon. Uh, so please come join us. <laughs>